Hello, welcome to Explore Game Dev. In this lesson, we will be managing turns between players in our tic-tac-toe game. First, allowing player one to place a piece on the board, then player two. This back and forth between players continues till a win is detected or the board is full and we're at a tie situation. In this lesson, we'll experiment with adding code using a process called test-driven development. So we'll perceive of functionality we want to add to the game, write the tests, and then write enough code to pass those tests. We'll be using the Godot uh, unit test framework known as GUT. In this tic-tac-toe prototype, there is currently no management of player turns. You're free to grab game pieces in a random order and place them on the board. To get closer to what we might consider a game, we need to implement the alteration of X and O pieces being placed on the board. From a functional aspect, much of the turn management will happen at the game piece holder. This is the small box on the screen holding the game pieces. In its initial starting game state, you would expect the game piece holder to allow any piece to be moved to the board. This is akin to player one choosing which piece they want to play. But from that point forward, the piece which was initially moved to the board would be associated with player one, and the other piece would be associated with player two. After this initial placement of a game piece by player one, the game piece holder would represent alternating turns by locking player one's piece on the board until player two has placed their piece, and then the opposite, locking player two's piece on the board until player one has placed their next piece. Currently, from a code perspective, the turn in our game occurs in the tabletop class in the on player placed game piece on board and spawn game piece functions. It simply checks for a victor. If there's not one, it spawns a new draggable game piece in the game piece holder on screen. So to this point, we've described the game piece holder as the manager of turns. This makes it a good candidate for creating a class dedicated to the game piece holder and isolating the logic and state for turn management there, rather than piling on more code into the tabletop class. As a first step, you'll create the game piece holder class and move the existing turn management code from tabletop to this new class. Then from tabletop, you'll use a reference to the game piece holder to set up the next turn. This initial step will isolate the game holder functionality in its own class, but not change the behavior at this point. Let's now create an isolated scene to hold the game piece holder scene and its accompanying script. In the tabletop scene tree, add a new node for the game piece holder of node 2D type and rename that to game piece holder. Next, make the piece holder nodes and the background children of this new game piece holder node. Now extract this game piece holder branch into its own scene. I prefer to use snake case for files, but that's just personal preference and then save the scene to its own folder within the Entities folder. Lastly, navigate to this newly created game piece holder scene and create the game piece holder script. So first move the function spawn game piece from the tabletop script to this new game piece holder script. Beyond that, in the game piece holder script, create an initialize function to inject the game board, which is needed by the spawn game piece function, in addition to spawning the first two game pieces as the game starts. Now in the tabletop script, add a reference to the game piece holder class and call its initialize function in the ready function. Additionally, the spawning of game pieces is removed from ready here, since it now uh, happens in the game piece holder script in its initialize function. Finally, replace the local call of spawn game piece with a call to that method, but now through the game piece holder class. Again, our initial goal was to introduce the game piece holder class, move the associated code from tabletop to this new class, but not change the overall functionality of the game in doing so. We can play the game again and ensure that it does behave as it did before. Now that you have a dedicated game piece holder class, you can start to implement the managed turns between player one and two, as we spoke to earlier. You will recall this is done by alternating the draggability of the game pieces. They are both draggable to start. Then for instance, player one drags X onto the board. At that point, player one is associated with the game piece X. At that point in time, the X piece has its draggability disabled. This allows player two to drag the O to the game board. Once dropped at that point, game piece O is locked 
and then X is unlocked, allowing player one to take their next turn. In the previous lesson, you were introduced to unit test using the gut framework. In this lesson, you'll leverage tests using a strategy called test-driven development, or TDD. You will write the test before you write the code. The test will, of course, fail initially, so then you will write just enough code to pass the test. You'll continue this process until you have all the tests and the implemented code needed to express the functionality desired. The theory is this enables you to write cleaner and more concise code since you're only writing enough code to pass the current test. It also guarantees that you have test coverage over the code in question. In our case, first test the simple case that in the starting state, both game pieces are draggable. In other words, they're both active. The goal in our TDD process is to simply write a test in the way that you would like to work with the class under test, adding methods and properties which are ideal, knowing full well that they don't currently exist. This will feel awkward at first, but it enables you to write the class in a way which is easy to use and keeps you from adding functionality that you won't need. It's also important to first see the test fail prior to seeing it pass. This ensures that you truly have the functionality you desired. In order to pass this test, game piece holder needs to store the game pieces that it currently holds, and then those game pieces will have a status of active or inactive. So to make progress towards that, let's add a dictionary called holder game pieces to the game piece holder class. Then we simply add a getter function called get game piece, which returns the current piece for either X or O. Then finally, as we spawn a new game piece, we add that piece to the holder game pieces dictionary. This is allows the function get game piece to return the current X or O, which is in the holder. So running the same test, it now fails since there is no active flag on game piece. So now let's fix that. In the game piece holder class, let's add an active property. Then let's use that flag to disable draggability in key places in the game piece class, as shown here. And now when we run the test, it passes. Next, let's test the locking mechanism discussed before. After the first player drops their piece on the game board, that piece is associated with them and locked in the holder. This allows player two to drag their piece through the board, but disallows them to pick up player one's piece. In this next test, gameplay is simulated by calling the currently fictitious initialize player turn function on game piece holder. Here we again set up the game board then the game piece holder. But in this case, we want to have a function called initialize player turn, which sets up the piece holder state for the current player's turn. This function has one parameter, which is the previous played piece. As expected, the test fails since the initialize player turn function does not exist. So we return to the game piece holder class and add the initialize player turn function. In order to support this function, the spawn game piece function had to be refactored in a few ways. First, we added the initialize player turn function. This spawns a new game piece, for example, an X piece. Then it determines the other piece, in this case, the O piece, and makes it active. We added this simple lookup to determine the other piece. So we added a parameter to spawn game piece to support this. And now with this added code, the test will pass. Looking back at game piece holder initialize player turn function, it could be a little bit difficult to read. You could add lots of comments to help the reader understand it, or alternatively, you can extract methods from it so that it is more self-describing by way of method names. Since we have tests in place that are passing, we can do this refactoring with less risk of breaking the game logic. First, let's extract the last line, which sets the active flag to true, into its own function called activate piece. Next, extract determining the other piece's type into its own function called other piece type. Then in addition, it's a bit redundant to define a variable on one line, use it on the next line, and only the next line. So we can combine those last two lines to shorten up the code. 
Lastly, in future lessons, we'll be doing a bit more in initialized player turn than just setting up the game piece states. So let's pull together these current lines and to their own function called set pieces holder state. Now when we run the test again, we see that they still pass, so we're confident we did not break the application. Thus, with these tests in place, we've shown that we can refactor code with confidence. Now we need to return to the tabletop class and replace the call from game piece holder to spawn game piece and turn that into just initialize player turn. This is better separation of concerns. Tabletop now doesn't really know the specifics of how turns are managed. It just simply calls the generic initialize player turn and leaves that logic to the game piece holder. As a final step, it would be helpful to have a visual cue in the UI signifying which game piece is draggable at any moment. This can be done in the game piece class by adding a setter function for the active attribute. In that setter, adjust the opacity of the sprite, set it to full if active, or cut it in half if it is inactive. Now playing the game, we can see the, the visual cue to which player's turn it is at any given time. In playing the game, you may have noticed that when players end up in a tie state, the board does not detect this, and it simply continues to hand out game pieces. We want the tie to be detected just as a win is. Giving game board an is full function would accommodate this, since on the end of each term, it could test either if there is a win, or if the board is full, then it can determine a tie. So, as we did before, start with the test. Create a file in the unit tests directory called test game board. Then add the simplest test first, testing that false is returned from is full on an empty board. Again, this test fails since there is no is full method yet, so let's change that. In this case, we're going to follow the tenets of test driven development even more closely. In the game board class, add just enough code for this particular test to pass, even though we know it's not the correct implementation. So here we just simply return false. This does pass the test. It may feel odd, but it keeps us progressing and stops us from writing code that's not relevant to the current test. Future tests will show that this implementation is not adequate and will refactor at that point. Next, we add a test for the state where there is one piece on the game board. Is full should still return false, so this test does pass. To round out our testing of is full, we want to actually test when the board is full and that is full should return true. So in this test, we set up a full board, and then we do see that it does still return false. The test fails. We expected that because we had that inadequate implementation. But now that we have our failing test, we'll go and refactor that implementation. So returning to the is full function, rather than simply returning false, we now examine the dumped state of the game board to determine if it is full or not. Depending on that, we return true or false. Now when we run the tests again, we see that it does pass. So now back to tabletop, we take advantage of this new tie detection functionality. We refactor on player placed game piece on board. And now if there is not a victor, we check for a tie. If so, we signal that. And then finally, we only initialize the next turn if there is no victory or no tie. So in this lesson, you were exposed to test-driven development. You conceived of the functionality you wanted in the game, and then you wrote tests for that functionality, and then just enough code to pass the tests. That stops you from writing unnecessary code in the game. So our prototype is starting to take shape, looking more like a game. We now have turn management between two players, Wins are detected. Uh, when that does happen, though, it is a bit anticlimactic, um, but we will be improving that as we go forward in the lessons, adding effects and whatnot. In the next lesson, we'll be extending on our game loop, um, adding transitions, adding a start screen with uh, fade transitions between scenes. So we'll see you in that next video. And as always, feel free to like the video and subscribe so you don't miss future content.